Hello everyone, um, we're back again for part two of the business planning, starting your own business webinar. We've got a couple of people uh, live at the moment, so we're just gonna give it um, five minutes for people to join us. Um, can you just confirm that you can hear us, um, either using the questions or the chat function? So I've just typed a message there in the chat function. So if you can just confirm that you can hear us by typing yes in response. Just asking if you can type yes in the chat function if you can hear us. For those of you that have just joined us, we're just waiting for a few more people to join uh, the webinar today. And we're also just double checking that everyone's sound uh, is working all right. So if you can uh, type in the chat function, yes, if you can hear us or put it as a question, that means that we can just get started uh, quicker. Brilliant, thank you so much to those of you that are confirming that you can hear us. Please, those of you that haven't confirmed, can you just uh, send us a chat or send us a question to say that you can, can hear us fine? We don't want you missing out on any of the content. We've got some technical people with us that are helping us check this as well. <laughs> Okay, so I think we're going to get started uh, just because we've got quite a lot to get through today. But if you cannot hear us at any point in time, please use the question or the chat function and we will be um, responsive to that um, and we'll be able to answer your questions during the webinar. Um, so for those of you that didn't join us for the last webinar, my name's uh, Rebecca Moody and I'm Enterprise Manager here at UEL and I'm joined by Kaliza Begum, Enterprise Advisor here. 
Um, and we are Team Enterprise at the University of East London, and we are a, a service based at the university, and we're here to support current students and alumni to support and develop their business. Um, and the webinar today is uh, part two of a webinar we did a couple of months ago. Um, and this is to kind of follow on from the learning from that webinar and give you some more kind of practical next steps for developing your business idea. So, um, as a bit of a recap, the, this is what we're going to be going through today. So we're going to do a quick recap on the last webinar we did, um, just so that those of you who did join us can have a refresher and those that didn't join us um, can just understand the context of where we've got to. And then we're going to go through a little bit about developing an action plan, how you can legally start your business, so what the options are for that and the process. Um, a little bit about building a team, how you develop a marketing plan and some stuff around accessing funding. Okay. So, during the last webinar, we went through um, the fundamentals of human-centered design. And this was all about researching the kind of viability, feasibility, and desirability of your idea. And there was lots of actions that came out of that webinar. And um, we hope that you've kind of developed your concept and your ideas off the back of that webinar. Um, and I just want to go through the four lessons that you should have learned or taken away from the process we went through in the previous webinar. So the first lesson is uh, the customer's always right. So one of the key components of the previous webinar was around desirability and testing your concept or your product or service with your potential customer. Um, and your first lesson that you should be focusing on is what your market research and what your customers said. So did they like your product or service? Would they buy it? How often would they buy it? How much are they willing to pay for it? How frequently would they engage with your product or service? Did they like the, the function? Did they like the color? Like depending on what you're developing, um, all of that really, really rich customer research, you absolutely, like that should be the first step in the development of your business idea. So coming back to the table, analyzing the research that you have done and developing and changing your business so that you're building a product or service that the customer wants and ultimately that the customer is going to buy. Lesson two is all around the viability of the idea. So uh, we did some stuff around pricing up your product um, or service during the last webinar and your task was to go away and undertake some of those calculations and then think about um, that in relation to your business. So ultimately, if that came out that you weren't making a lot of money from your business or whether that came out uh, that you weren't making a profit, again, you need to go back to the drawing board. Like people go into business fundamentally to take to make money. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I see entrepreneurs make is they uh, will start off thinking that they can charge lower and kind of gradually increase their price yeah to some extent that does work your pricing will change but ultimately from day one you need to be making money from your business like that is why you are starting a business that should be why you're doing it um whether or not you've got a social purpose whether or not you're thinking of starting a social enterprise you still need to be making enough money to cover your costs um, cover your salary and your time and then making a little bit more on top of that. That is how you sustain a successful business and indeed grow a business. The third lesson, um, one of the fundamentals was that entrepreneurial IQ. So thinking about your own skills, where your gaps were, um, what are you really good at, what do you bring to the table and what do you need to develop? So lesson three is what came out of that analysis? What are the areas that you need to work on? Um, and if there if there are areas or gaps in your knowledge or in your um, kind of ongoing team, then you need to go away and find a team to, to fill those gaps. 
Um, there's some potential ways that you can do that. So at this stage of business, some people bring on a co-founder. So some people look for a business partner to fill that skill, um, skill gap. So you might be a really creative person, but actually want to bring on someone with kind of a business background or a sales background or a finance background. That's quite a big step for your business, bringing on a co-founder. Um, but at these earlier stages, um, it can really, really change the direction of your business. The other one is um, bring on um, a team member or an intern or a volunteer. Um, potentially, you could work with UBL um, and think about taking on a student, uh, for example, if you need to develop your marketing material, if you need to develop um, a logo. There are great websites for kind of those creative skills. So there's websites like Fiverr, Freelancer, um, lots of different websites that you can use to access kind of web development skills, graphic design skills for fairly cost effective prices. Um, there's also some great websites where you can advertise roles on. So there's things like Escape the City, um, things like jobs in SMEs. So lots of opportunities there for you to kind of build and bring on talent into your team. Lesson four is all around your business model canvas. So your business model canvas was that final step in the business planning process and you originally put together a business model canvas of something that you your initial proposal but actually now that you've got your customer feedback now that you've uh, got some insight around your pricing what you need to do in with your business model canvas is go back to it and change it based on the feedback that you've got and then you then need to develop a plan from your business model canvas so in terms of now setting some goals for the business the sections that we've highlighted here on the business model canvas are the key sections you will be able to extract some immediate goals from um, so if you've identified some key partners obviously your first action is write an email and contact those key partners and do a scoping exercises if you've identified some key resources, your first initial actions are where are you gonna get those resources from? Um, if you've identified some key costs, another one of your actions might be accessing funding to fund some of those costs, or indeed trying to get some of those resources that you need to pay for. If you've identified that you are gonna sell on a website, one of your tasks will be developing a website. So from your business model canvas, you should be able to pick one or two goals and actions from each of the sections, which then will start helping you turn that kind of conceptual business idea into action. So that's all we're going to do on the recap side. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time and maybe haven't gone through those steps, I can't stress enough that those are the four fundamentals to that starting a business. If you haven't done those steps, ultimately, you know, your, your potential business idea moving forward is at risk. You should build a business that is customer has a customer demand, ultimately is going to make money and then develop your goals out of that and obviously have the right skills to take that forward. So the rest of the webinar is for focus for people who have gone through those steps in their business planning process. So once you have um, gone through those key steps, the next thing is obviously you need to actually start your business. So starting your business um, is, sorry, we just got some technical, technical difficulties. <laughs> We solved. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to move that one out of the way. Because for some reason the webcam is not showing. Can everyone see the webcam? They can now. They can yeah, see you can see it? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, got carried away there with the fundamentals of business. So once you have been through those key steps, you then need to make a decision about what structure you're going to be and how are you actually going to formally start your business so when do you do that what action takes place for your business to start um i normally ask that as an open question but i'm going to answer it now so the first step really is 
the moment you start advertising your business that is when you need to take those steps to start so the day you give out your first business card or set up your first facebook page or kind of start going to your first networking event and talking to people about your product or service um, that's really when you need to think about officially starting your business because by advertising your product, you have the intention to start trading. So even though you might not make money for three to six months after that or more, um, ultimately what you're saying is I am ready to start trading because I've given you my business card and technically from tomorrow, um, you could start trading with that person. So once you start advertising, you need to know what structure you're gonna go to. Um, what I'm going to go through now, we've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to go through company structures, um, and this is quite a unique and bespoke um, consideration for your business, so if anyone's confused um, or needs more support, we will need to be able to follow up with you kind of individually to take this forward. So I'm going to run through the company structures. So, the first is a sole trader. So a sole trader, uh, people call this different things. This is being self-employed, a freelancer, a gigger, a consultant. People call this different things. Um, but ultimately, when you're a sole trader, you work for yourself and there is no separation between you and your business. To register as a sole trader, you need to, there's three ways to register. You can do it online. You can download a paper form and send that off or you can call them up um, and you register direct with HMRC. And when you register, you get a 10 digit code, which is a UTR code, and that's your unique tax reference. Um, and you are enrolled in the self-assessment system. And the self-assessment system is how you pay tax when you are self-employed. Um, becoming a sole trader, it's the quickest and easiest way to register, um, particularly for those of you that aren't sure about uh, how the business is gonna progress or what it's gonna look like. It's definitely the kind of easiest and quickest way to get yourself set up. A lot of people start out as a sole trader and then evolve into different structures um, once they've kind of developed the business in a bit more detail. The second uh, structure is a partnership, um, the same as a sole trader, other than there's normally more than one of you. Um, you. You register in the same way, you register with HMRC, but obviously you submit your information together. Um, advantages of partnerships are obviously, you know, other, another person can bring a different skill set to you. Um, you can typically raise more equity and finance when you have another person because it's a shared risk. Um, but the kind of downsides of partnerships is a lot of partnerships go go wrong. There's a lot of disagreements. Um, I've seen people that have been friends for life start a business together um, and actually running a business with someone is quite different than being friends with them. So if you are going to go down the partnership route, make sure you agree your terms up front. Make sure you sign some kind of agreement or contract um, or understanding between you kind of before you get involved in the business because it's really important to have those uh, terms set out in advance. The third structure is a limited company. Um, so a limited company, the easiest way to describe it is when you set up a separate legal entity. So when you're a sole trader, you are the business and there's no separation between you and the business. When you start a limited company, you you kind of birth a brand new separate entity so it exists in its own right um, in order to do that you register through HMRC um, you need to pay to register and it normally takes 24 hours and you will get a unique company number um, before you register a limited company you need to go you need to find a, a company name it needs to have an address, it needs to live somewhere, it needs to have a director, someone that's gonna own that company. Um, you need to define the company's shares because you've started a separate legal entity so people can own parts of that company. It doesn't have to be 100% owned. Whereas when you're a sole trader, you are the business, so there's no separation between the two. Um, a lot of people think that when you start a limited company, you immediately get protection uh, around your company name. Um, it's a little bit of a myth because when you start a limited company, yes, you have to search on the company's registrar 
um, to see if anyone else has that name. And if they do, you can't register um, as that. However, these are. Um, however, if you register as a company name, someone else can still trade under that name, even if they aren't registered as that name. Um, slightly complicated there, but you, the only way really to protect your company name is to, to trademark or um, to go through that process. So just by registering a limited company, it doesn't give you a protection over the name. Um, yeah, I mean, being a limited company, uh, more complicated process for sure. Um, a lot of people think it makes you look more official because you've got LTD um, after your name. Definitely when you start a limited company, um, people, you know, even though it's only you, it can obviously appear like you've got a whole company behind the interface of you as the director. Um, more complicated in that you have to submit yearly annual returns and you also have to submit annual accounts and your accounts are available to the public on company's house so a lot more information about your company and your trading is available publicly um, it's easier to raise equity because obviously you can share, sell parts of your company um, so it's much easier to raise finance with a limited company the other biggest advantage is that your initial um, your liability is limited to your initial shareholding in the company. So to explain that, when you are a sole trader, um, if the company goes into um, a lot of debt and uh, or you're sued or um, kind of those worst case scenarios, because there's no separation between you and the business, you are personally liable. So things, you know, they can tap into your personal savings and your house and your car and all those types of things. Um, if in the same instance that happens and you're a director of a limited company, because you've set up a separate legal entity, um, it's the company that's responsible for the um, the kind of any debt or any um, kind of negative things that have happened with the business. So it means that your personal assets are protected. Um, there is a lot more to that. As I said, we are going through this quite quickly. So if anyone wants to know more about that after the webinar, please follow up with questions. Um, we're really happy to kind of offer support and advice. Ultimately, for those of you that are just starting out, um, a sole trader is kind of the best way to test your business. Um, and during those early stages, it's kind of the best way to initially start out. Outside of that, there are, um, those are the only kind of structures that we're gonna go through today, but there are, um, there is social enterprise, which is obviously a business with a social impact. Um, with social enterprises, they come with their own structures. So there is cooperatives, there are CICs, there are charities. So there are lots of other options when you're setting up a company, but it's really bespoke and dependent on your own personal circumstances and your own idea. Um, it's dependent on your short and long-term goals. So um, if anyone's unsure, it is better to get um, some advice so that you've got all the options in front of you. Um, okay. When you are setting up a company, you also need to know kind of what you are financially responsible for. So I'm just going to run through the tax and national insurance implications. Um, national insurance. So when you, national insurance is paid in classes. Um, these are the four classes of national insurance. So when you're employed, for those of you that have already got a, a job, um, either a part time or full time job, you will pay class one, which is that top box um, in the corner. When you register as self-employed, so when you uh, register with HMAC as self-employed, you will pay class two and you'll pay class four as well. So class two is a flat rate. Um, hopefully you can see my mouse here but it's a flat rate here um class two and you will pay three pounds for every week that you're available to work 
Um, so when you register as self-employed, you know pretty much that you're going to have to pay about £150, which is your £3 um, over the 52 weeks of the year. You also need to pay class four, and this is calculated at the end of the year. Um, and this is calculated based on your, your profits at the end of the year. So if you're not making um, over 8,632, you won't pay any additional class four. It's only if you make over that, that you will be paying class four, but it's all calculated at the end of the year. Just a note on all of the tax and national insurance rates that I am quoting, they are all available on the HMRC website. They change every year. So if anyone is um, accessing this in the future, some people might be watching this on YouTube. Um, if anyone is accessing this after April 2020, none of these rates will still be valid. These are only valid for the tax year that we're running this session in. So these will change and you will need to look them up for future years. Um, so yeah, if you are self-employed, so this is if you register with HMRC, you will pay classes two and classes four. If you are um, a director of a limited company and you are paying yourself through a payroll system, you will pay class one because when you're a director of a limited company, you work for that company um, and you'll pay national insurance the same as if you were employed. Tax. So um, national insurance is paid in classes, tax is paid in rates. Everyone um, gets a personal allowance and that changes every year as well. So this year, everyone gets a personal allowance of £12,500. Um, that is, you can earn up to £12,500 and not pay any tax. Um, if, you, if you earn under that, you still have to declare it. You just won't pay any tax. So you still have to let them know that what you're earning. But if you earn under that, you won't then have to pay any tax. If you earn between 12,501 and 50,000, you will pay 20 percent tax. If you earn um, between 50,000 to 150, you'll pay 40 percent, and then you will pay more after that. So this is when you are self-employed, this is all calculated at the end of the year. So you'll submit a tax return at the end of the year, show them what you've earned, and then it will calculate whether you need to pay the 20% or whether you need to pay the 40% or what you will need to pay. Um, it looks like we've got a question. Perfect. Okay gonna pop that down mm. okay so when you are self-employed um, you need to start thinking in tax years so the tax year runs from the 6th of April to the 5th of April so if you register a business today, so this is if you register with Companies House as self-employed, you are registering a business in the 1920 tax year. Um, and this is all to do with your kind of self-assessment and how you pay tax. So if you register a business today, so this is being self-employed, you will your trading will be between today and the 5th of April 2020. So you will need to record everything that came in and out of your business between now and the 5th of April. Around a couple of weeks after the 5th of April, you'll receive a letter asking you to complete your self-assessment. And that's where you'll need to demonstrate what your earnings of the business were between that period of time. If you want to do that by paper, you've got until the 31st of October to submit and return that by paper. If you want to do that online, you've got until the 31st of January 2021, so the following year, if you want to submit that online. And you will also have until the 31st of January 2021 to pay the bill. So if you leave it until the 31st of January, you will only have until then to pay. 
Um, so the important thing there is that, you know, if you start today, you'll need to keep a record of all your earnings between now and April, and then know that you're going to get a request to submit your self-assessment after that. This is only for people that are going to be registered as self-employed. For those of you that are registering a limited company, when you, when you incorporate your new company, you as the director decide what the accounting year is. So these deadlines are not going to be relevant for the people who are for the people who are setting up a limited company. When you set up a limited company, your deadlines are determined by your own accounting year, which you set. So I can't advise on that. This is if you're registering as a sole trader, um, as self-employed. So when you do your tax return, um, what you need to, the figures that you'll need is you'll need all of the income from the business, you will need all of your allowable expenses, and then the figure that you're left at the end with is what you're left as as profit. And the profit is what you will pay tax on. So you don't pay tax on all of your income, you pay tax on what's left at the end, on the profit that's left. So um, if you want to know more about what those allowable expenses are, it's all available online on the HMRC website. There are webinars on this um, that are in a lot more detail than what we're able to cover today. When you have a limited company, so when you are a director, you pay tax and national insurance slightly differently. Um, and you also have some slightly different options in terms of rates. Um, so as a director, you will pay tax the same as um, you would if you were employed, but you can also take money as um, bonus, bonuses or dividends. So your first £2,000 of dividends is tax free. Um, after that, you will pay 7.5% on the first bracket and then you'll pay 32.5% on that second bracket. Um, so the brackets are exactly the same as the tax rates that you pay when you are salaried. Um, again, if anyone wants to go down this route, I would recommend you come to our tax workshop because it is um, three hours long just on this stuff. Whereas today, we're trying to whiz through kind of the early stage stuff in 20 minutes. The other thing to be aware of is when you have a limited company, you obviously pay your own tax on the income that you earn from the business and the company because you've set up a separate legal entity the company will also pay tax and that is corporation tax so you'll pay your own personal tax and then whatever's left in the company as profit you will also pay 19 percent corporation tax every year and that will be done when you submit your annual accounts um, and the deadline for that is decided by your own accounting or tax year so that's all we're going to cover on setting up your company. Um, so the first thing that you need to decide, what structure am I going to set up as? We would recommend initially setting up as a sole trader. Once you've made that decision, understand what your tax year is. Have a look at some of the information that we've gone through. Um, but also, there are so many webinars. HMRC have an amazing business and education department, and they have a number of webinars which go through all of this stuff in lots of detail, and we'll send some of them out to you. And we also run a tax and national insurance workshop, which is three hours, and again, we'll send out the dates for those. So I'm going to hand you over to Khadiza now to talk about once you've started your business, how do you start marketing that um, when maybe you haven't got um, a huge amount of money available to do that. Hello everyone. Let's just do a quick switcheroo. <laughs> you guys stretch your legs. Hey, so I hope that was really useful. I know it was really useful. That's gold that Becky gave you just there. Real good overview of everything you need to know. And I can't stress enough that if you come to our workshops, that's when you'll get, you know, the FaceTime. You can ask as many questions as you like. I know it's quite overwhelming. It's a lot of heavy <laughs> stuff. Um, but I think it's a lot more accessible than going on the .gov website, which I know a lot of people find very stressful. So um, please do come and take up our, um, our invite. 
shall we say, um, you won't regret it. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about marketing strategies. Again, it's going to be an overview because these are all um, really uh, just a snapshot of what our full our workshops are about. And the marketing strategy workshop is coming up in another two weeks. So please do look out for that on the Eventbrite. Um, a lot of this will build on our first webinar, which kind of looked at the whole market research, and understanding who your customer is and the marketing strategy is basically how you send that message on and hopefully convert that into sales. All right. So. A bit of lag on my screen. Skip that. So the marketing strategy should basically cover all these different things. What is it that you're selling? What's the offer? How do you communicate that value to the customers? So what are the features and benefits of your product or service versus what's already on the market? How is it better? And you know what? Why should they buy it really? Where to sell? So where in terms of geographic locations, um, the kind of market that you're trying to penetrate. So what industry is that in? Which sector is it in that you need to work on? Um, also, any partnerships that you might potentially find. So if you're doing, say, a beauty based company, whether you're going to go to boutiques or salons or if you want to go, you know, mainstream and you want to be stocked in boots, definitely go for it. But you need to be aiming in the right place. So making sure you're in the right location for people to come and buy or find your products how you're going to sell it. So how will you distribute this? What is the pricing strategy? Are you going to do promotions? Are you going to do partnerships? What channels will people find your product through? Um, is it in store? Is it on online? Is it a combination of the two? Okay. And then who you're selling to. So again, the target market and the customer and also the sub -seg sub segments. Sorry, it's a hard word to say after seven o'clock. <laughs> so um, please do kind of look into that. For those of you who did miss the first webinar and our market research session, we do have that happening next week. So that will be a three hour workshop to help you identify who it is that you should be selling to, who would want your product and how you validate that. OK, so we always have an idea of who we think is our customer and who we'd love to buy our product. But until they buy, it, it's not um, a sure thing. So you're going to be aiming all your marketing efforts, all the money that you're putting into selling it to the wrong people if you haven't confirmed who the actual demographic is. OK, and first of all is that you should always remember, and I'll say this a couple of times in this session, marketing is not sales. OK. People often confuse marketing with sales, but it's not. Marketing is basically creating that funnel to hopefully securing a sale. Sales is a whole different thing on its own. Marketing is all about all the promotion, all the advertising, all the messaging to get them to understand your product and get them ready to buy. OK, so you're basically honing and preparing people to choose your product over X, Y, Z on the market. So marketing is broken down into two main categories. So there's outbound marketing and inbound marketing. OK, so I hope you can all see that. I might just get rid of my face so you can get a bit more of this lovely diagram. Um, if you want, you can do a screen grab. But I think everything will be available as a recording afterwards. So outbound marketing is basically all the noise that you're making about how great your product is. OK, so it's you putting things out to the world. So all the sort of advertising billboards, things that you are putting out in terms of the communication of your product that is outbound and then inbound marketing is people discovering your your product or service through word of mouth through SEO so it's things that are pulling people to you okay inbound marketing is a lot more effective because it feels more organic and people are more likely to trust inbound marketing because there's a level of trust that's built up through that okay so it's things like you know when you see reviews etc um, if you're doing Google searches, you're going to rank high if you've got like a good trust pilot rating, if you've got lots of reviews linked to your website, if you've got other websites linking to your website, if you have lots of people shouting you out and saying that you're great, all that kind of stuff will pull in traffic to your website, to your business, to your brand. So inbound marketing is definitely something I think you guys should all invest in. It's slightly more expensive than outbound, um, but it's more effective in terms of getting a return on your investment. OK, so imagine standing on a corner and handing out a thousand flyers and only 10 percent of those people actually want to buy your product. You've wasted a lot of money on those flyers. OK, whereas with inbound marketing, that 10 percent who want to buy your product will find you. OK, so they're doing all the legwork. I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, do just um, flag them up and I'll try to answer them. OK. 
So the next thing I want to talk to you about is reviewing your target market, okay? So this is stuff that, like I said, we covered in the last session, but we will be covering in the market research session coming up in startup school. So you need to understand who it is that you're trying to target as your customer. How can you prove this? So is the people you think will buy actually buying the product? And also who else can buy it? So once you've kind of targeted, say, students, okay? Who else fits a similar, um, kind of personality or customer profile as a student, okay? How else can you reach these people? Because once you've exhausted a certain customer market, you need to find other people to keep your business afloat. You can't just expect one kind of customer to keep your business alive. So you need to try and diversify. And if it's not just students, what can you do to make it appeal to more people? So how do you add more benefits or more features to your product that will make it appealing to more people than just the original um, group of people that you entered the market with. Okay. Um, another thing is to really hone in on your elevator pitch. Okay. Your elevator pitch is what you can kind of come back to time and time again to kind of create marketing material. Everything should be there packaged nicely in a nutshell about what your product stands for, what the values are, why are you different? So for example, if I was to run this elevator pitch by you um, in terms of the UAL Enterprise team, so what we'd say is for students um, who want to start a business, UAL Enterprise helps them do this alongside their studies. Unlike other universities, everybody in our team has started a business. Okay, it's very clear, it's simple, it's easy to remember. I've covered all the main things. Who are we working with? Why are we working with them? What's the benefit to them? How are we different? Why choose us? Okay, so this is something that you should definitely create for your business. This is the kind of stuff that you could put on your advertising, on your packaging, um, you know, on your Twitter bio, on your Instagram bio, that kind of stuff. So this is something you should spend some time on developing and always keep changing it to make it more and more effective, okay? So the stronger the message, the more likely people are to, to buy into you, okay? And more likely to lead to a sell. And also define the marketing aims. So why are you undertaking these activities, okay? So lots of people do things where they don't know what they want out of it. If you're going to put 100 pounds into printing 10,000 flyers, what do you want that flyer to do for you? Do you want people to then follow you on Instagram? Do you want them to come to your store? Are you going to offer a discount code on there? Is it just about general awareness? All those kind of things. So don't just make things if it's not going to have a call to action or an end point in sight, if that makes sense. If you're giving someone a business card, clearly you want them to hopefully get in touch with you, okay? So if you are going to create lots of different marketing material, there needs to be a reason for that. And I've seen so many bad bits of marketing material. People have spent money printing or getting a designer to do things for them. And they've missed out key information, you know, like where it, where can they contact them? You know, what's the website? Do they have an Instagram? Um, why choose them? All those kind of things, or even just poor design. So it doesn't really even help the brand because they've used a very fancy font and it doesn't um, communicate any information. So always plan ahead and also realize why am I doing this? Um, what is the impact of what I'm trying to achieve? It's important to know the aims because the aims will help you also figure out what kind of content or what kind of activity you need to undertake. So if you see this diagram here, and you can see at the top on the left hand side, it says awareness. And on the right hand side, it says purchase. And the top says um, emotional and the bottom says rational. OK, so this matrix helps you understand what kind of um, material you might want to create to help people understand your product or buy into you a little bit more. So if you can see my mouse here, if you want to raise awareness and educate people, okay, you might want to create an article, you might want to write an ebook, this might be a free download on the website. We've all seen that when you go onto someone's website, can you please give us your email address and we will send you a free ebook or we will send you a checklist or you know, some special content that they've created for you, or, you know, a seat on their webinar, for example. So there's lots of things that you can do depending on what your marketing objectives are. If you want to inspire people, then you might be able to afford a celebrity endorsement, for example. Reviews are a great way to also build trust. So on this emotional level here, where people aren't sure whether they want to buy or not, you know, once you said this has five star ratings, this has um, 10,000 reviews, etc. You're more likely to get people's trust because the stats are there and people buy into stats. 
okay if you want to convince and educate you might want to create a, a video okay you could do this easily on on snapchat or instagram you could go and do a live demo all those kind of things or if it's a little bit more complicated than that you might want to do youtube videos does that make sense okay also you need to have to track this so what i would definitely use is the smart model which i'm sure we're all familiar with so make sure it's specific measurable achievable relevant and time bound otherwise you're not going to stand on that corner doing those flyers for 10 years and hoping you're going to make sales you might just do it one weekend and see if it's actually had an effect okay you might also figure out christmas is coming is your product relevant to the christmas market is it a giftable product and see if that has any effect so you need to check the seasonality of your product as well to see if there is consistent demand just lost my mouse, there we go. So here's an example. So you might have a specific target. I will acquire five new customers for my hair salon, okay? And how will you measure this? I will measure this by how many new customers I see against the existing customers, okay? So you have your regular customer base, and if you see five new people coming through the door, you know that's something you can measure, okay? Um, how are you going to make it achievable? So I'm going to promote this by having an ad in the local paper and giving out discount codes. So that's the, the pull to them, that's how you're going to attract them, okay? Um, and then you're going to increase your customer numbers. Um, sorry, half my screen is covered by it all this webinar software. Okay, so increasing my customers will help increase my revenue and grow my business base. Okay, so that's what makes it oh, sorry, relevant to your business. Okay, and then lastly, the time restriction. So you're going to give yourself a month. Okay, so aim to have these five new customers in the next month from when the ad is published. So you're going to see if the ad has gotten you five new customers in a month, then it was worth you doing that. Okay, maybe you've got you even more customers, maybe you've got you less, but you need to figure out or have a measure of how effective something was. Okay, so if you can afford a billboard, you know, and you put it on a busy dual carriageway and you know how many cars pass through that during rush hour, you know, all those kind of stats are there when people sell advertising spaces to you. When you're doing an ad in a newspaper, for example, they'll tell you how big the readership is, how big is the circulation. So they'll tell you roughly how many people they expect to see that ad, and then they value the ad based on, on the number of people that will see it. Okay, so use those numbers to help you also determine um, what kind of return you should be seeing for the work you're putting in, for what you're paying. All right. Another thing is being remarkable, okay? So where this came from is obviously someone is so great at what they do or an experience is so fantastic, they have to make a remark, okay? And that's the word remarkable, that's how it came about. And word of mouth marketing is still the oldest yet the most effective type of marketing there is. So if someone recommends something to you, you're more likely to buy it. We always ask our friends and families for their opinion or their recommendations just because we trust them. We always read reviews before we buy something online, okay? So Amazon is huge on this. Um, I know there's always been some kind of issues with some companies doing, you know, fake reviews or buying reviews, and you always have to take things with a pinch of salt. But if you do have enough good quality reviews that are genuine, then that will also help you build your brand's reputation. OK, so always try to gather this kind of stuff and always display it somewhere. So when someone comes onto your website, it's clear for them to see testimonials, reviews, um, photos from customers using the product before and after. If it is a product that will show some kind of transformation, these are the things that sell products. OK, so try to gather this kind of stuff. Um, also have a little statistic on this. So 90 percent of people will believe a brand recommendation from friends and family, okay? And I'm sure we've all been there. So this is why it's really important for you to kind of have that information to back up your product or service. So that's free and that's easy to do. It just takes a bit of legwork from you to write up the reviews or, you know, just following up with customers. Hi, thank you for buying our product. We'd love you to leave a review on our website. And I'm sure you've all received emails like that as well. Um, sometimes they also encourage it with a discount code or a freebie when you buy something again. So try to do those kind of things to help you build up the reviews, especially if you're a new business, okay? There's nothing worse than going on a company, seeing a product that you've probably never heard of, you don't know if it's any good, and if it's quite pricey as well, you need to convince people by having those trust pilot reviews or recommendations from others who've already bought this and say that it's fantastic, 
let people sell it for you okay so um traditional marketing okay so print marketing um whatever your thoughts might be on this we still see banners we still see posters flyers business cards everywhere and i still recommend that you invest in this kind of stuff it can be quite pricey but make sure you're doing it for the right reasons and you know why you're creating the material you are if you're just having a one-off event you need to figure out if it's worth you investing in a banner if you are someone who pops up all over the place a banner would be great for you to kind of signpost to yourself and raise that awareness because you don't have a fixed location OK, and that banner can have all the information that people need to know about your brand. So nice big logo at the top. What is it? A photo of the product or service? How can they contact you? So make sure all your social media handles or your website is clearly visible. OK, all those kind of things will help you with retaining customers or also just pulling people towards you. OK, so have a really nicely designed banner if you're going to go and do that. Make sure your brand also is reflected in your marketing material. So, for example, here's some business cards that a divorce lawyer would have. OK, there's a little bit of humor in there, but it's also practical. So it definitely brings the business to life. So think about how you can do this with your business. At the end of the day, you want them to keep your card and then you want them to follow through and reach out to you when they need to. OK. So here is some other examples. So this one here on the right is for a musician or a guitar instructor. This person here on the left is someone who's a detective. So it really embodies the brand and what it is that they're trying to do. Because if you're going to get lots of white business cards that have black text and just a little bit of information, it doesn't help people remember who you are. So think about it. If you're having conversation with someone, you say, oh, I teach guitar or I teach people music. Um, or I'm a musician and they give you a card like that, you're more likely to remember that when you see them. You're more likely to keep it as well. OK, so this is for a shipping company. Again, just really fun, easy. But again, something people would keep. And also, if you don't really want to invest too much into a business card or, you know, you don't want to print off 100, you're just getting started, still not really fixed on a business name or idea. Um, I recommend you you get a stamp or something like that made. OK, and you just keep it really simple, maybe with just your email address, something that's not going to change. OK, but something that will help them reach you and it enables you to turn basically anything into a business card. So um, these are really effective. They're very cheap. You know, this one here, as you can see, is attached to key rings. It's on you all the time. Um, so just be really creative. OK, people won't keep scraps of paper, but they will keep something if it's got um, something memorable about your business, if you've got like an elevator pitch on there or a simple one line or slogan about your business. If you can have a picture of yourself on there, people do do that, it might help, especially if your business is about you. Um, or if you have a product, then make sure that you've got a nice clear picture of your product on there too. Okay, so offline strategies. These are kind of the traditional approaches, you know, from like radio adverts, uh, newspaper ads, those kind of things the old school stuff, but it's still very, very effective. OK, so here's some examples. I'm not going to read them all out for time. Like I said, you'll get the recording later on. But this is all about, you know, direct mail, print advertising, broadcasting, billboards, as we mentioned, bus stops, etc. OK, so these are great ways to do offline marketing. Um, you do it once and then you put it out to the world. So it's not as consistent or as intensive as social media marketing for example where you have to keep topping it up just because there's so much content being pushed out all the time so here's some examples um you know gift vouchers um can you make your packaging really outstanding so um i don't know if you guys have done it but it's very popular for people to do unboxing videos or take pictures of their post when it comes in so if you can make it more than just a boring jiffy bag if you could put really nice branding on it if you could do it in a nice funky color something that stands out people are likely to share it and say oh look what's arrived in the post from so and so company and those are the small things that help you build traction okay you know the traditional pizza fly that comes through your door it's still very effective and if that's the kind of industry you're in i would highly recommend you go down that route because if you do have a brick and mortar business it's all about being local and you need to let the local neighborhood know okay and you'll fly within a certain radius or a certain postcode or uh, a borough because you're going to get that local footfall okay now we're going to talk quickly about 
online strategies, which you're all probably very familiar with, and it's also quite overwhelming. So, you know, your website, web advertising, banners, pop-ups, all those kind of things, direct mailing, newsletters, so MailChimp, um, and then also sponsored links, ads on Google, SEO. So social media is something we really need to talk about because social media is free and it has a global reach. Okay, it can be very cost effective if you handle your social media accounts well. But first, you need to figure out which platform you need to be on. So as I mentioned in the previous webinar and doing the market research, once you know who your customer base is, you know which kind of platform they use. Okay, because they are also broken down into different demographics. So people who are LinkedIn, they're more ready to sell business to business and they're also slightly older. Instagram and Facebook, so they are essentially one company, but they kind of do very different things in terms of their interface and the kind of content that they champion. So Facebook is definitely the first one I'd recommend everyone to create a business page on because it has the largest online following. It is one of the oldest social media platforms and it has a great spread of all different ages and backgrounds and interests. Um, it's also easier to target people on Facebook marketing just because people are always populating Facebook with everything that they like. OK, so all this data is captured and you can then use that to retarget people with ads. Twitter, I wouldn't really recommend for advertising, but it's great for broadcasting information. So Twitter is more like a linking site. You go on Twitter and you talk about um, a sale you might be having. So click here to enter our sale. So Twitter is almost like a trampoline. You go on there, you see it, but you don't stay on Twitter to consume the content. Twitter redirects you somewhere else. So click here to watch this YouTube video or go on our website for X, Y, Z or like us on Facebook. That makes sense. And then Pinterest is more about visual inspiration. People link um, checklists on their how to's, all that kind of stuff. So if you're in like the decor or crafting or lifestyle based businesses, Pinterest is definitely something you want to invest in. OK, I wouldn't say go on everything because media, social media is 24 seven. And if you have that kind of time, great. But to do it all well is very difficult. OK, so don't spread yourself too thin. Try to pick one and get really good at it. Grow a really big following just because it helps with building that brand credibility. And it's easier to convert people who are all on one site than going, I have 200 likes on Facebook and 20 followers on Twitter and 50 people on Instagram. If you just focus on one, you can really maximize your efforts. OK, blogging, if you're in the information based field, if you are selling lifestyle, those kind of things. If it's um, even books, for example, if you want to position yourself as author, you need to first be discovered for your writing. So Blogger, Tumblr, WordPress, Typepad, these are great platforms to begin on and make sure you are putting out regular content. OK, so you need to keep it full. And then as you go on, you can start deleting work that you're not as proud of. But you first need to start having a mass of work. So when people go on there, there's lots of things for them to look at and to read. OK, hashtags. Hashtags are a fantastic way for you to find, you know, conversations that you need to be a part of. You can create your own hashtag and start a movement. People hashtag their business names um, and they create their own hashtags as well. So you can educate your audience by jumping on a hashtag or creating your own. And it gives you some ownership of the field you want to be in. Hashtags are also a great way to find trends, um, you know, see what current developments are happening in your sector, what kind of influencers are tweeting or talking about what it is that you're doing and posting about. So these also help you identify potential partnerships that you might want to think about. OK, so hashtags are a great way to do research, but also put out information and have it be found. So it's sort of like inbound marketing. OK, so if you're in the beauty hashtag vegan beauty, be quite specific. Beauty is quite broad in itself. So if it's vegan or natural or um, all those kind of things will help you um, find the customers or the customers find you. Podcasting is really popular. I know lots of people listen to podcasts. I know I do. And information based audio is actually taking over audio. Um, entertainment based audio right now. So people are listening to ebooks and news and um, podcast shows 
all those kind of things over music in terms of audio. So this is definitely something you can jump on. It's very cost effective and a great way to talk about your brand. Whether you're going to create your own podcast, so if you're a social enterprise or you're doing something that you want to get people to get involved in, you can create your own talk show. Okay, it's really cost effective or I would try to become a guest on a talk show that covers the topics that you want people to know about. So you're positioning yourself as a thought leader. And an extension of that would be panel discussions, so get your face out there. You need to be the face of your brand. It can be very awkward for some people, but you need to kind of put yourself out there as someone who is really relevant in the industry and doing amazing things. So once people recognize you, they will come and approach you for more work or to advise them on things so you can become a consultant for other companies okay so you need to start getting yourself out there also attend events where panels are happening from people who are doing really well in the business that you want to go into so then you can meet them and create those connections okay so it works twofold if you are doing something in the entertainment field you definitely need to have a showreel okay if you're trying to launch yourself as a musician or an artist or a filmmaker people want to see what you can do, okay? So if I go on there, they need to have lots of things on the YouTube or lots of things on the Instagram. Seeing is believing, okay? So your work needs to sell itself. Another thing you can do is paid ads. So this is moving towards more expensive forms of getting your marketing message out there. So you probably see these little sponsored um, icons, um, they have to be very transparent online if something is being paid for and also if you click on them it will tell you why you're seeing the ad so next time you're on instagram or facebook and you see a sponsored ad if you click on it it'll tell you why you're being you're seeing it it might say because you live in xyz area it's because you're a certain age for example it's because you said you like certain um activities or interests and that's how they're targeting you this is also very cost effective. So you could just start with as little as five pounds and see what that's done for you. Five pounds on the internet is more effective than five pounds trying to print flyers, okay? So test out different things and see what works for you. And then sponsorships, okay? So sponsorships are probably very expensive. It depends what kind of sponsorships you're going for. If you sponsor uh, like a football team, be it a school football team, you can get your logo out onto you know, their t-shirts, on any games that they're doing, they'll shout you out at the matches, all those kind of things. So how else can you get your, your name out there? Or also if you can get sponsorship from a big company, that also makes you look good. So again, it's a two-way thing. All right, and then Becky's gonna quickly round off by talking about some financing. Um, I hope that wasn't too heavy. Like I said, it is a three hour workshop we're trying to put into 10 minutes. <laughs> so back to Becky. Hello. So to finish up, um, the funding piece really, again, is really, really bespoke. Um, ultimately, um, it's really dependent on the sector that your business is in and the area that you live in. It can be restricted by age, location, all sorts of things. Um, but these are the kind of the core ways that you can fund your business. Um, the, I mean, the first way is kind of through personal savings and friends and family. Um, the majority of businesses are started through that mechanism initially to get them off the ground. Um, you know, the preferable, other than friends and family, the next preferable one is a grant. Um, unfortunately, business grants are few and far between. They're really, really hard to get hold of unless you have a business um, maybe that has a social impact, um, a business that's solving, um, you know, one of the sustainable development goal problems. So something like um, sustainability or whether your business tackles stuff around the environment there are some very specific pots of grant funding for um specific sectors so if you are developing a business that you think has a social benefit or an environmental benefit it's more likely you'll be able to access some grant funding for that um, the best place to start searching is through your local council and your local lep so your local enterprise partnership those are the best place to start searching for grants um because as i say they can also be location specific um if you're not able to access a grant, the next step is to explore whether there are any competitions. Um, there are a lot of uh, student competitions. Um, a lot of student competitions are open to alumni who've graduated in the past two years. 
Um, there are also a lot of um, competitions around sectors as well. There are a lot of competitions for people um, under 30. So, so there were, depending on your individual circumstances, there are a, quite a few potential competitions that you can apply for. Um, and they come with anything between, you know, £2,000 and £50,000 prize funds. So there is quite a broad range of opportunity available there through entering um, competitions. Um, another option is uh, loan funding. So the government has a scheme called Startup Loans, where you can apply for up to £25,000 um, low interest loans to help you start a business. And they're distributed through a number of different um, organisations. So if you go on the Startup Loans website, there's loads of different um, companies that then distribute that loan funding. Um, you know, there's traditional loans from banks, um, but that again is dependent on your personal circumstances, it's dependent on uh, your credit rating and your other financial circumstances. Next option on from that is crowdfunding. Um, so there are again different types of crowdfunding platforms. There are um, crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter, where in exchange for your exchange for money, you then give people um, a product or a service in return. So if someone um, contributes £20, you might send them a postcard or you might send them a sample. If someone donates £1,000, you might give them an opportunity to come and have dinner with the founder. Um, so there's kind of incentivized exchange funding. And then also in the crowdfunding space, there is equity based funding as well. So places like Crowd, Crowdcube, Cedar, there are a number of sites where you can raise money through crowdfunding um, through giving away uh, equity, which would mean you need to have a limited company. Um, there are some local and national funding pots. So again, like starting with your local council. And then in terms of the national funding, there are some government funding streams such as um, Innovate UK funding um, and therefore like much larger scale projects. Um, there's also international funding available, really depends on your sector. Um, sector specific funding we've kind of touched upon but I think when you're trying to look for funding pick out five things that make you or your business idea unique and search via those five unique characteristics um, and they're often based on your location the sector that you're in um, if you've got any kind of environmental benefits the, the kind of level of funding that you're looking for anything unique about you um, and your background those are kind of the five things to really think about when you initially start to search for finding the right type of funding. Um, you've then got incubators and accelerators. So these are set programs which you can apply to that often come with um, business space. They often come with finance. They often come with support. Um, again, incubators and accelerators are also typically sector specific. So there is um, incubators and accelerators in fashion, in um, cyber security, in technology, in healthcare, in um, creative sectors, in high street innovations. There are incubators and accelerators for most sectors. Um, so again, it's really specific. Um, the next level up from that is um, angel investment and then on from that is VC investment. Um, so the funding landscape is massive, but this is for kind of when you're first getting started, um, you know, friends and family, grants, competitions, they're your kind of top three that I would start with. And those are the kind of the risk free ones. Um, and then the next level up, obviously, typically there's an exchange of either equity or an agreement where you need to achieve something or give something back in return. Um, UEL has a couple of funding pots available. So we have our e-factor competition, which is where we give out um, £6,000 to the winning um, applicant. That is open to current students and alumni who graduated within the past two years. Um, we also have a business growth fund, a small fund available, um, again, for businesses that have been trading um, over 12 months, but under three years. Um, and we've got small grants of £2,000 for people that are looking to grow their business. So two pots of funding available through UEL Direct. Um, outside of that, then I would recommend exploring these options here. That is it for us um, at the moment.
Um, what we wanted to leave you with is we do hold one-to-ones at our Stratford and Docklands campus. We do them on alternate Thursdays. So if you um, would like to discuss your idea and your individual circumstances in a bit more detail, um, please email us at enterprise at uel.ac.uk. So it's just this email address here. Um, if you would like to book in for a one-to-one, -one, please let us know your preferred location and your preferred time, and then we will try and get that booked in for you so that after these two webinars, you have got that kind of next step um, and we can give you some kind of tailored one-to-one -one advice around um, your own marketing, your own company structure, your own um, financials. So, you know, all of the stuff we've gone today, we've gone this massive overview, but actually the stuff in today's webinar is quite bespoke and typically it needs an individual discussion. We also have um, our series of startup workshops. So they cover all the stuff that we've covered today, but in a lot more detail. Um, they take place um, on Tuesdays, typically in the morning. So next week we've got market research, the week after we've got marketing strategies, and that um, they're going to take place. Um, <laughs> sorry, more technical troubles. Um, they're going to take place here at our Docklands campus. So if anyone wants information about those, um, please again drop us an email and we can send you the Eventbrite link. We have a community um, on Facebook. So if you like us at Enterprise at UEL, we will then make you part of our community of entrepreneurs where you can meet other entrepreneurs from UEL and you can network and um, get advice and um, just become part of a supportive network and community. That is also the link to our um, Instagram. <laughs> so you can also catch us on Instagram and just keep up to date with the stuff that we've got going on, um, when we're launching funding, when we're launching programs and opportunities that you can engage with. Um, Kadiza is still here with me. So thank you so much. That is the, the end of our series of two webinars. Thank you so much for joining us. And we hope you found that really useful. We covered a hell of a hell of a lot. So um, if you are feeling confused, please just drop us an email because we're here to help. Um, that's what absolutely what we're here for. Yeah. Hope to see you at startup school. Yeah, definitely. Great. Um, and we will see you hopefully really soon. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>